I'm Jason Pettigrew, and welcome back to Cautionary Tales, the podcast that reminds you that expectation management is the key to life. Matt Good knows something about that topic. As the co-founder of Screamo Metalcore Emissaries from First to Last, he's seen how the best laid plans, exasperating naivete, and an obsession with impatience can bring about great opportunity and self-defeating depression. These days, Good is doing great in his roles as a producer for bands like Asking Alexandria, Memphis Mayfire, and The Word A Lot, and he's digging life as a family man as well. For First to Last exists as a leisurely pursuit, along with his project with Asking Alexandria's Ben Bruce, Kill It With Fire. On the podcast, he discusses all the trials and tribulations he endured keeping from first to last moving, the unfulfilled promise of destroy, rebuild until God shows, and how being a father and a producer is keeping him grounded as a person and as a musician. That means you're probably not going to see him touring in a van for six weeks ever again. If you could go back in time and tell 19-year-old Matt, what would you tell him? Oh, um... Just uh, be patient. I think that would probably be really good to know. Just patience is a virtue then, huh? Yeah, pretty much. I was always, uh, I was really, really motivated when I was younger, like to the point where like it was maybe just a little too much sometimes. So I I think I would just go back and be like, hey man, just have some patience and uh, everything you want will come in time. Just, you know, just got to, you know, be patient obviously and it will happen. The, um, well, I mean, were from first to last early days, were they kind of like a, was it a, did you want it to be a roller coaster ride or did, was it happening at a decent pace or did you feel it was like glacial pace at that time? Um, well, when we very first started, it, there really wasn't a pace at all. We were just like trying to figure out that question of like, how do we make it? You know, like how every band is in their first, like, what do we have to do to make it? You know, so it was just like, a long, long time spent trying to answer that question, and it just seemed to elude us. But we did literally anything we could think of, anything we could all the time to try and, like, you know, be considered relevant by anyone. So they would, you know, we would be given an opportunity. And so, you know, it seemed like nothing ever happened, even though things were happening, um, just very small things that you don't really see until you can step back and look at the bigger picture, like, way later down the road but uh yeah i don't know i guess like i never really intended it to be a roller coaster ride i really was hoping that once things started to pick up eventually that we could just maintain where we are at and you know continue to grow as musicians and as our band over time but obviously like that didn't that did happen in ways but in a lot of ways it didn't because we went through lots of uh different things i've talked about this stuff so much now it doesn't really it doesn't affect me anymore (laughs) Gotcha. Okay. I know that at one point in time, um, uh, you had, uh, I guess you had, uh, already signed with Epitaph for Dear Diary and your original vocalist, Philip Reardon, I think he, who I believe quit on his own accord and was replaced, uh, was replaced by Sonny. He came back and later sued, uh, from first to last for something. Okay, so actually that's close, but that's not totally right. So okay. what happened is we had met Phil and we just didn't click like on a on a lot of levels, especially personally. And uh, it just was for the best that we before we because like at that point we had signed Epitaph, so it was like, okay, we're obviously gonna be doing this full time now. We're gonna be spending a large amount of time together as people and whatnot. And like, when you have like an obvious disconnect with someone, it's just like, we should probably take care of this before we're in in way too deep. And it becomes a much bigger issue later. So I would, you know, we, it was just one of those things that had to happen. And, uh, you know, it was okay. But the, um, the suing part is real, but that's not from him. Actually, that was from our, uh, our bass player, John. And that didn't happen until farther on down the road. Uh, after Dear Diary had been successful. And uh, there was actually a lot of things that amounted to, to him leaving the band. But uh, long story short, he was uh, upset about the fact that we had asked him to leave. And uh, and then him and his father took to suing us. Yeah. I'll see you guys in a bit. Okay. So, so it, wasn't, it wasn't Philip. It was the other guy. Yeah, no, like Phil, you know, we split and like, you know, I wouldn't say there was no hard feelings, but it wasn't like a thing that like, you know, was a huge deal. We were just like, yeah, you know, this isn't working and it's okay. I get it, you know, kind of thing. Gotcha. Um, 
during Sonny's original tenure with the band, that'd been like 2004, 2007, right? Mm-hmm. Those dates, right? Uh, there were obviously some public growing pains. I mean, young dudes in a band, you know, like it's a pirate ship for a while. There's like psychic and psychic and physical things that were happening. Is it just basically dudes growing up in public or were there certain business things that were weighing heavily on from first to last? There's a lot of, a lot of things that come along with uh, like once you get like tossed into like the machine, I guess, if you want to call it, it's like, all right, so this is what you've always wished for. This is like your wildest dream come true. And you're like, yeah, this is great. And then uh, I don't know. It's like, it is amazing. And like you, every day is, is fun. And, but I mean, you know, you're still a person, you know what I'm saying? So like there's days where, especially when you're younger, when you're like 18, 19, 20, where like you just, are not having a good day or like, you know, maybe like you just question yourself or like what's going on around you. And I feel like those things are are pretty typical and natural of people in in that age uh, bracket. But they, I don't know, they seem to be amplified when you are in that situation where it's like you feel like almost stuck. And it's, you know, looking back on it, it's like, why would you want to be stuck in a lot of anywhere else? Like it's a good place to be stuck, but still it's like that feeling of being like, okay, I'm in this van, like something terrible happened in my life or like I just woke up today and I just feel bad, you know, and like there's no escaping it. There's no your own time, your own space. And, uh, you know, you feel like in a lot of ways, like you are just like stuck and there's nothing you can do about it. And uh, I just think that like those days, they're few and far between most likely for a lot of people. For us, I would say they were, but I don't know. It's like you hear a lot more about the bad things and you do the good things for some reason. Um, and that just may be the case here. Okay. So uh, after Sonny left in 2007, um, I believe, I mean, what exactly happened with Capital where you dropped? Um, was that, I'm trying to think of when that was that time because obviously EMI, their parent company, was hemorrhaging money. I just don't know exactly what that window was, if that started it or something. So I don't know. There's kind of like a weird thing. So, I mean, what happened? Were they just cleaning house? And because you didn't sell a a billion records the first time out on on their label, they said, okay, goodbye, or what had happened? Actually, uh, I never even got to that point. So what happened was um, we had fulfilled our obligation with Epitaph after Heroin came out, and we were free agents. So we were getting courted around by everybody at that point because the band was pretty hot at that point. And uh, we we met with just about every label you could imagine. And Capital ended up being the ones that we just felt like were going to be the right fit for us. And they were willing to invest like the amount of money that we thought at that time would be necessary to like take the band to the place we wanted it to be. And um, the owner, I wish I could remember his name still because it's for some reason it's eluded me over the years, but he was awesome. And he was just talking about like beastie boys and like how he was like a drug addict like earlier in his life. And he had been through all these crazy experiences. And like, he just seemed very like a uh, hyper aware of, I don't know, a lot of things that we clicked with. So are you talking about Jordan? Sure. No, no, no. Uh, he was at Geffen. So this is at Capitol. Oh, okay. So, um, uh, he, uh, I just cannot remember his name for some reason, but he was awesome. And, uh, so we signed with them and then shortly after that, I would say like four to five months after that is when Sonny decided he wanted to leave the band. And so we had never actually recorded or released anything since we were with Capital. So what happened is we then met with Jordan Scher after Sonny had left and I explained the situation to him. And he was like, well, I think that you guys can still be the band anyway. And we'll make this thing awesome. And I was like, really? (laughs) You believe in us? You know, at that point, we were really scarred emotionally. We didn't know what to do. We were very scared and unsure of ourselves because, you know, everything that we had worked to build was now completely different. And, you know, you're going into uncharted territory, obviously. And uh, he believed in us and wanted to work with us. So he was with uh, Interscope at the time. And capital as you were saying they were hemorrhaging money from what i understand and they got bought out like right in that time period so they had to uh go through and clean house and i think jordan basically talked to them and convinced them to let us go and then they picked us up on interscope so it was like a little swap uh okay gotcha ah, a little little martha stewart insider trading okay gotcha. yeah exactly <laughs> 
So you did that. Um, you did the self-titled record. And um, did you feel at that time that like from first to last had something to prove? Um, did you feel like you were, did you feel like you had something to prove and you were going to do it by any means necessary? And uh, the whole vibe of what it was like there working with the Jordan Shure? It was, it was sort of like that, but I, I think mostly what it was is the only thing that we know in the world and in our lives is being in this band. Cause like at that point, you know, you're years and years into it and it's the only thing you do like for your whole life. And like, especially when we made heroin and working with Ross Robinson, like, I mean, he really like, he's really all about like the artists, like, you know, living their art, like being that a hundred percent. And like, at that point we were so like, yes, like we are this band this is who we are. Like it was my entire identity. So like the idea of not doing that anymore was literally the scariest thing I could ever imagine. So at that point you're like, I will do whatever it takes to continue doing this because the other option is I'm screwed more or less because I didn't have a college education. I didn't really know what else to do with my life. And I had a really rocky relationship with my family at this point. And, uh, yeah, you know what I mean? It's just, (laughs) I don't know. You just have to do what you got to do. But, uh, we made that you record. You had no plan B. There was no plan B. And to be honest, I talk about this with people a lot, but many, many, many artists don't have a plan B. And in a lot of ways, it's really good. And I feel like it's very empowering. But when it comes down to it, when the situation really comes to like, okay, what do I do now? You realize like, oh God, this is really, really bad. It was really scary. I don't know what to do. So in some ways, I can empower people, like I was saying, to do great things. But also sometimes it doesn't. So take it, take it as it is, I guess. How did you get out of your Interscope contract? Um, oh, they just dropped us because we didn't sell a billion records. Like you said. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of, but it's a weird thing because you made significant changes to the kind of music you were making and they thought they were going to sell it to somebody else, but yet maintain the same fan base that had come to love and adore from first to last in the beginning. And there was a a significant disconnect. Right. And I mean, I'm sure you're aware. I'm not even, I'm not here to say anything negative, but like, I feel like that's a commonplace in record labels. A lot of times they'll assign a band because they're like really good at something and people love them for that. And then they try to change what that is. And I've actually never understood the philosophy behind that. I think that's kind of a strange way to go about things, but you know, whatever. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's like the the music business is is filled with those types of those types of situations. Sometimes they work out, sometimes they don't, um, and sometimes hindsight's even better. Like how many people absolutely love "Dear You" by Jawbreaker, and I remember when that record came out and everybody hated it. Corporate sellout, punks, blah 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 blah, and now people absolutely love and adore that record. So mm-hmm. you know, it's it's that's probably the most. That's probably the biggest one where everybody's revisionist history, or maybe it's just a different generation listening to it and understanding it and accepting it on a different level that people were too busy uh, looking at the the logo on the back of the record cover to actually listen to the record. So right, there's, right. Uh, there's also fans to, 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 buy, to, to blame for that as well. That's inevitable. So you, uh, you signed to rise and you, and you did uh, thrown to the wolves. Mm-hmm. 20, 2010, I believe that was. Yeah. Um, and that was a pretty ripping record after coming off of the uh, the Interscope experience. Right. Um, but then five minutes, five months later, like five months after the record was out, you uh, you called uh, you called for the band's hiatus. And looking back on that, were you just feeling malaise about from first to last, or did you get a phone call from Craig Owens? Um, it's actually the. It was kind of a combination of things. So even I love that record. I felt like we were the most uninhibited we've ever been on that record, which is, you know, a really fun area of ourselves to explore. Uh, And the music was really cool. And in a lot of ways, I feel like if that was a record we had come out with, uh, you know, before, like after Sonny left without ever having done self-titled, that may have been better for us. But I don't know. It's really hard to say because I know a lot of people like the self-titled record too. So I don't know. It's like... It's really hard to, to guess this kind of stuff, but um, yeah, I don't know. So basically, we we were feeling kind of at a low point. Um, we were on tour with a lot of bands at that time, like uh, Asking Alexandria, funny enough, and like 
we came as Romans and stuff, all these bands, uh, Memphis Mayfire, they're all like kind of coming up. And it was kind of the beginning of a new era of heavy music in our little scene that we've come to love and adore. And I feel like, you know, the tides are turning and they were not turning towards us. It was kind of like what we were doing was kind of like a sound of the past at that point. And like the new sound was like, you know, more of the, the heavy, like breakdown centric kind of stuff. And I, in that moment, was just trying to look at our situation as objectively as possible. And I was like, I feel like no matter what we do right now, this isn't really clicking with people on the level that it used to be. And uh, I don't know if this is right. And it was honestly reflecting in our in our personal relationships and stuff too, because like, I mean, obviously if, if what you're doing isn't working, it isn't necessarily as fun anymore. Um, so, and then coincidentally, not long after that, I had talked with Craig about that, about the drugs project and it just kind of seemed like it was meant to be. So I decided to call for the hiatus and go do that. And drugs is very, I, I never, I mean, I, I never heard anybody throw any type of massive shade at it. I mean, it seemed that uh, all these personalities were together and it was really, it was really good. And people were, you know, identifying with it and stuff like that. So then, you know, it seems like that band had a really all too short run. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, essentially what was it? Was it, was it a situation where, I mean, what essentially was the end of that? Was it, uh, was it, uh, Craig had the, uh, the invite all is forgiven, come back to Chiodos or was there something else in there? Um, I mean, you know, that, that was part of it. I just, you know, that, that situation is hard to talk about, but, um, it was just one of those things where, uh, you know, you have to, I was talking about this with Shane on his podcast, the lead singer thing. Like it was one of the situations where you have to look at where you're at, how it's affecting you. And it wasn't just me, obviously, because, you know, we all, we all, uh, left the band at the same time. And, uh, you know, we just decided that where we were at personally, um, with ourselves and with the band and everything, it just wasn't healthy anymore. And we wanted to just kind of, stop. <laughs> I don't even know what else to say about it. Like we basically just decided that it was in our best interest to stop doing that. And Craig was, uh, he seemed interested in rejoining Chodos at that point in time. So it kind of made sense to us to just let it go. Yeah. Uh, there, I mean, there were, there was obligations there for sure. I think that people definitely, uh, were expecting a lot out of us on a commercial level, which I, to be honest with you, never really necessarily understood. I didn't think that that record sound, sounded overly commercial um i didn't it didn't sound to me like a record that you were going to hear on like you know the, the rock station in, on in kentucky or something like that you know like maybe like k-rock but i don't know about anything past that i mean maybe that's just a difference of opinion i don't know but yeah i mean that that came into play i think like you know like some loss of working relationships with certain people in the band's uh business camp was part of it and I don't, I don't know. It's just, I think on a personal level, like we were all just feeling fatigued. Um, it was a second band that we had all been in. Um, we had been touring a lot and like, you know, it was working, but uh, there was just like, you know, we'd run into obstacles and I think that everyone was just worn out and uh, just ready to move on with life in general, basically. In fact, actually, we all talked about how none of us really wanted to play anymore. And the only person that has continued to play is Nick Martin. And that was actually kind of very random because I don't think he really had any plan of that. It just kind of happened. And uh, he was like, well, I think I'll just do this. And it's cool. I'm really glad he did because he's had a really great, really great experience with the Sleeping With Sirens guys. And I love those guys a lot. I think it's really been good for him. He seems very happy. I don't want you to think I'm being tenacious, but I'm kind of wondering, like, um, it was just that you were just over touring or something, or was it the dynamic of these people, or was it was it some person on was it some person or people on the other side or something? Because it seemed like when you talked about getting from first to last, kind of putting that on, you know, putting it on hiatus or forgetting about it because there had been a sea change, it seemed like you were on the cusp of something new and reinventing yourself as a player, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? In a different context. So I guess, is this kind of those things where like, there were like social, 
social situations or once again that whole concept of the whole concept of the of the pirate ship how you're all a team and then you're like on your pirate ship and this is it but then you know the 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 stress fractures start to show on that stuff or is it the fact that everybody had been playing in relatively successful bands together to I mean, let's use the word supergroup because all of those people who were in that band were, you know, had some sort of profile to them. Honestly, the thing I want to say about it, I think the thing that's most important is that uh, I developed really great friendships with Nick and Aaron and Adam. And uh, I still talk to Craig and uh, we have a healthy friendship again. And I think that lots of things happen that, you know, I... I don't personally agree with and they just led to things happening that put us all in places where we decided that it'd be better if we just didn't do it anymore. And, uh, I felt like honestly in my life, it was probably one of the most adult decisions I've made uh, really because the, the band, um, at face value was doing pretty well. I mean, the tours that we were participating in were getting more successful as time went on. And I love the band's music and everything about it. It's just, I had to, I don't know, you just had to look yourself in the mirror and be like, okay, is this what I want to keep doing? Or is it time to move on and take the loss and just say this is for the best? And that's kind of where where it went. You know, there are still fans right now who are really kind of hoping and clamoring for a drugs reunion. Is there anything you would like to tell them? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> we've, we've tossed the idea around and stuff and like, uh, the thing is, is like, we all love the record. Like we really love the record and we loved playing together. And, uh, I think that if certain things had gone differently, we would still be a band right now because seriously, like I thought that the band as musicians and everything, like we had an incredible chemistry, especially on stage. Like I felt we all had a really really great chemistry on stage. Like I remember there was nights we were playing where I was like, man, this is like some of the best I've ever felt on stage with people. And it was a really cool feeling. And I don't know if that's because maybe I was just like going through the honeymoon period or something because I had come off of like, you know, my, a negative situation from first to last, like not, ne- I don't want to say negative. That sounds too much, but you know, it just wasn't what it used to be. Right. So maybe I was enamored with like the new found, uh, success of this band I'm not sure, you know, it's hard to say looking back on it, but it felt so good. It really did. Like some nights I was like, man, I feel like we're like the best band ever, you know, but, uh, I don't know to the fans that love that band. I love it too. So I guess I'm a fan as much as you are. I heard somebody was telling me that I heard some sort of story that the band, all of you together, minus Craig, would have continued playing, but there was some sort of language in the contract that you guys couldn't play together with a different lead singer for whatever reason or something like that. It was, it was crucial that Craig was part of the mix. Yeah. Is that, uh-huh. is that well, BS yeah. or is that a contra- contractual thing? Is that a reality? It's, it's part, it's part real. Um, we wouldn't have done that without him because I mean, you can't deny the fact that he was a face of the band. The band was built around him, you know, like, uh, it's his lyrics, it's his message. It's, you know, like people, people gravitate towards him as a singer and an artist and a writer because of, you know, who he is and what he has to say. And I think I, I think that I can speak for all of us in saying that we appreciate that enough to know that it wouldn't work with someone else. At least I don't personally believe it would, but, uh, but he does, I mean, on paper, like legality speaking, like he, uh, he does own the band name. So like he, you know, no one counts can be drugs without him. Gotcha. Okay. So then right after drugs, you started Kit Fisto, right? Oh yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I did that. That was, yeah, that was fun. That was just uh, me and AJ were living in LA together and we wanted to learn how to produce and like, you know, uh, we were working together also as a, a writing team for, uh, a pretty, like a, a publishing house kind of thing, like a little studio where there's like a bunch of different rooms and everyone just kind of writes and helps each other out and stuff. So we make it Fisto kind of for fun. And we just wanted to learn how to produce and make, you know, remixes and sounds and stuff, which is, uh, I'm incredibly happy I did that. Um, it probably sounded, seemed weird to people at the time, but I think I was just like really grabbing for something that was the most extreme opposite of what I had been doing because I was feeling kind of jaded in general towards music at the time. And I wanted something to just kind of take my head out of it for a while. And it was great. 
it's actually one of the most productive things I've ever done because I learned so much about, uh, about what it is that I do now for my living. So it's very in- integral that I did that, which is funny. Did you actually, did you leave your guitar in the case or was it, you yeah. know, was it something uh-huh. else? Okay. So this is actually, uh, I don't think I've ever talked about this. So one of the things that I did is I sold all my guitars. I just got rid of all of them. I didn't want to see them or look at them. And, uh, I made, I made it a point to learn how to write music, um, all over again with, without having any instruments except for my computer. That was like my number one goal. I wanted to learn, reteach myself how to write because I had written everything on guitar prior to that. And I felt like, I don't know if I was to like grow from where I was. I want, I just wanted to like learn how to approach music in different ways. And it was working for you then. Yeah, and it still works for me now. Now I've incorporated the guitar back into my writing process, but not heavily. Like I still, I still like to uh, start away from a guitar because I feel like it kind of pinpoints something too much right away. So it's something I still do. When you got involved, when when the, when the two of you were doing things, uh, was it kind of liberating in that? It's not a band, and I don't have to deal with five people and a manager and a business manager and this, that, and the other thing. You were still trying to create, you know, you're still crying, still being creative, but also you were able to uh, pay your rent doing this. Right. I mean, it was just, it was complete creative liberation at that point. I was like, okay, I don't have to care about what genre this is. I don't have to care about what instruments I'm using. I don't have to care about like what other people are involved. I don't have to care who's singing. Like it, you don't have to care about anything. So you're just like, I'm going to open up my laptop today and I'm going to start creating music and that's it. <laughs> and it's just that simple. Yeah. And it felt so good. It was very needed at that time in my life because I wasn't really sure what I was doing. And uh, I, all I'd ever known was being in a band. So as we were talking about earlier, it's like you're going through that process of trying to figure out your new identity in the world. And I think that that was really a, a great facilitator for me to kind of make the next step forward in my life and figure out what it was I was going to do and who I was going to be. But then in 2013, you reactivated from first to last. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, I mean, obviously it seems like you're in control of your, it seems like you're in control of your destiny because you've limited the circle of people that you need to get your artistic vision across yet you restarted the band. So that's, what's kind of, I mean, what was it that happened that made you want to do that after, you know, really enjoying what you were doing with AJ and, and working with, you know, laptops and, you know, computer based things to create music. Oh, okay. So there's actually, there's a little bit of story in between there is that like me and AJ never officially stopped doing Kit Fist or anything like that, but we've just, I mean, it was never really that official in the first place. We just kind of, uh, what happened is I organically started producing for bands locally where I lived. Um, because my manager, Zach, he introduced me to this band and he's like, Hey, I have this band, like they need help writing some songs. Do you think you could go help them? And that was actually the first time I was like, okay, I guess I'll dive into this with some guitar and stuff like that. So I went and did it. And then, um, and all the cool skills I had acquired from working with AJ and doing the laptop thing and everything, they all kind of came to use. And I was like, Oh, like, you know, this stuff is pretty applicable to music now. Like there's so many things that I can do that are really, really cool that, uh, not tons of rock producers can do. And I just started doing those things and incorporating them into my, my workflow, you know, producing, you know, rock and metal music. And, uh, and I started to become a full-time record producer. So when I decided to reactivate from first to last, that was more of like, um, I don't know. I, <laughs> it's hard to explain, but basically I felt like because I had a, a full time steady thing that was like my new identity that I was searching for, I, I had found it. And then I was like, okay, well, people miss the band because they, they tweet me, dude, every single day, no matter what I post, even now, like today, literally today, people are like, when are you put out that new from first to last? <laughs> like, it's ridiculous. And it's awesome. And I really appreciate it. It's really cool. But, uh, it, that's never gone away. So basically I was like, okay, well, you know, I got a little bit of some free time. Um, there's no pressure anymore. There, I don't need this band to pay my bills. I don't need this band to survive. I don't need it for anything other than just pure enjoyment, just pure artistic creativity and outlet. So we were like, all right, let's make a record. I'm sure people will be stoked if we make a record. So we made a record. 
it's like it's really that simple and, and usually it is for us honestly and obviously spencer spencer sotello was involved as the front man mm-hmm. and i guess everybody i mean you would already uh we haven't spoken about we haven't uh spoken about um travis richter being back back in the fold oh yeah you know after you had uh, you were like s- s- essentially started the band with him and then kind of something you're uh decided not to work with each other anymore and all that and yeah. he went to do the human abstract and you were you know moving forward with stuff so essentially it's uh it's all pretty great in 2013 and then sunny comes back the following year and if i'm correct correct me if i'm wrong uh right now like as that like as sunny comes back it's like the dear diary lineup all over again right is yep. everybody back in yep it's just the dear diary lineup minus john obviously because you see this yeah and then so obviously and then that lineup makes the two singles make war and surrender right uh-huh okay and here we are right I, I would say that the band is the equivalent of a bunch of guys that get together because they're really great friends and play like at their local bar on Saturday night. That's like this is basically from first to last is your poker night. Yeah, for sure, exactly. But it's like we are the band name is still highly relevant to people, and obviously Sonny's a, a huge, enormous star. So I mean, like when you factor those things into it, it takes it to a different level. But yeah. That's it's our hobby. You know, it's what we do because we love each other and like we love creating music with each other. And like that, that bond has never gone away. Like as soon as we started working on Make War, it was just like, man, this feels so great, guys. Like it, I don't know, just it's really, really nice to have everything come back around full circle and just be in a room and look at each other and just be like, holy shit, we're all in a room together again. And just like be happy, you know, it it felt really nice. So uh, where does, as we are speaking right now, where, what is the status of from first to last? Will there be a record this year or what do you think? Um, I don't know if there'll be a record this year, but we've been working on new music. Like we were just working on some stuff a couple weeks ago um, over by Sonny's house in LA. And, uh, you know, we talk pretty regularly about what stuff and, you know, we have ideas and stuff that we want to accomplish. But, you know, like I was saying, like, there's no stress. There's no time frame. There's no anything. It's just like when we feel like we have a bunch of a couple songs or maybe just a song or whatever it may be that we love and we think other people love them. We'll probably just put it out and just be like, cool, here you go. That's what happened with make war. I mean, we worked on the song for like six or seven months, honestly, like not like hardcore, just like, Oh, we have a day. Let's, you know, fuck around with make war a little bit. Okay. And then three months later, hey, I was thinking we should change the bridge. Okay. And then eventually, Sonny's like, hey, you should come out and we'll mix a song. And I was like, okay. So we were at a studio in Hollywood. We were mixing the song. And then uh, we went. I, this is a cool story, too. We went to go to John Feldman's studio to show him the song because we wanted to see what he thought about it. We were just kind of curious. And he was like, yeah, come on by. And Blink-22 was there. And they were like, hey, this is sick, blah, blah, blah. And Travis is like, hey, man. Are those real drums? You're like, no, I programmed them. He's like, cool, let me play those drums. <laughs> We're just like, what? So we let him play drums. And then uh, we went back to the studio the next day, put the drums Travis played into the song. And then we're like, I think it's done. And so he's like, yeah. And then he's like, cool, let's put it out. I was like, oh, yeah, sure. And then, like, you know, he was on the phone with like the owners of Spotify in like the next 15 minutes on a Saturday night. And uh, they were all on a conference call together. And the song was out the next day like by like 2 or 3 p.m. It was crazy. Not bad. You didn't have to wait for anything. It was immediate gratification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Which is a lot, which is definitely (laughs) not the, well, okay, here's the setup and the advanced copies will go out then and the press will do this. And then we're going to leave this a week before. No, you just, here it is dudes. That's it. And it's just that simple. And it gets out into your fans. Your fans are stoked because they weren't expecting it. And uh, the internet makes that possible. So it seems like everything, like you said, it's it's not. Uh, you, you don't have to pick between playing in a band and nutrition anymore. You can actually eat and pay your rent and not worry about this other stuff. Right, and it's. It, I wish that I really wish in a way that every band could 
live like that. I know it's extremely difficult because you have the pressures of real life on you all the time, but there's something to be said about making music uninhibited from expectation or need, you know? And, uh, I don't know, like it's really, it's really hard to put into words, but it just feels better to me. I don't know, maybe cause I'm older. I don't know what it may be, but I'm really happy about it. Well, you went through a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, I mean, when you went through a lot of stuff at the beginning of from first to last, and you had to experience all these highs and these lows and try to navigate that. Plus, the way you were you were talking about, you know, kind of being estranged from your family and not having a plan B is probably the greatest motivator. And you know, mm -hmm. I don't I don't know if you've acquired a taste for ramen or if the sodium killed you or something like that. But that's a big consideration, especially in in uh, California, where everything is expensive everywhere. Right. Um, you've been, so you've been producing for a while now. I mean, asking Alexandria, word alive, Memphis Mayfire, veil of Maya. I mean, there's a lot of big names that you've have that you've, that you've worked with. Um, what's your philosophy going in to make someone's records? I mean, like you're obviously had a bunch of producers that you worked with, with from first to last. And I'm wondering how much of it is sonic and how much of it is psychological when you're dealing with a band. Um, <laughs> I would say it's probably about 50-50. Uh, the, the psychological thing is, is interesting because my, I, I try to go into it and a lot of times like I'll know what the band's about because a lot of the bands I've worked with, I'm fortunate that they're pretty established actually. So I, I already have a pretty good feel for what it is that they have been going for or what they want to start going for as opposed to what they have been doing. But I always like to go into it thinking like, okay, like I want to just be the fifth or sixth member of this band right now. So like I spend, you know, the two to three months or whatever it may be, just kind of like, uh, kind of putting myself in a position where I feel like I'm in the band with the members. And I feel like that way it's really easy to become emotionally connected to what it is that you're making. And if you consider it like you're in the band with them, I think it helps me care about it on the same level I've always cared about my own music. And since I know firsthand how important it is for something to be done really well, um, you know, from my own experiences and whatnot, uh, I think that's a great thing for me to bring to the table. You know, nothing really slips by, you know, or falls through the cracks that way. And uh, plus, I don't know, like, I really, like, I've had the pleasure of working with people that I really enjoy who they are. And like, I'm still friends with everyone that I've worked with. And like, you know, like to the point where like we text frequently and things like that. And I think it's, you know, probably because of the fact of what I was just saying, you know, I like to develop a nice, a very strong relationship with the people I'm working with. I want them to be able to trust me. You know, I want them to know that like I care. So if I give them an opinion, it's because, you know, it's because I care about what they're doing and I care about them reaching the success, you know, through their music that they're looking for. What is rule one in Matt Good's way to make a record for a band? Rule one? I mean, definitely rule one is just that everyone shows up and cares. Like, that, that's the number one most important thing. But I would say, like, the way I am, um, it, it's actually, it progresses as the record goes on, as people get more comfortable. But I would say I'm kind of like a fun jerk. Like... <laughs> Uh, to, like I'll, like, I like to mess with people, but like, it's in a lighthearted way. And they know, they know that it's like in all, it's all in good fun, you know? Cause I like to keep the vibe, uh, not like so serious all the time because I, I think that like when people are happy and laughing and stuff, it, I don't know, it just helps the creative process. I think it brings out the, the, the youthful innocence in people and helps them come to the ideas that are really good quicker and easier. <laughs> Everyone that I've worked with has been very motivated and has really cared about what they were doing. Like the first record I ever made was for The Word Alive, and that was uh, Dark Matter. That was the first like you know uh, label record I ever made, and they, uh, you know, there was like a lot of um, stuff going on with their band at that point in time, and like you know, because they weren't really sure what they wanted to do. Because as anyone who's listened to that band knows, like Dark Matter was a pretty big departure from what they had previously been doing. And, oh, uh, absolutely. yeah. And you know, there was uh, a ton of days where like, you know, the band would just be like, all right, well we need to sit and listen to all the demos we have and decide which ones are working, which ones aren't. And like, be like, okay. So we'd spend like all day doing that and talking about it and be like, okay. So at the end of the day, we spent all this time doing this and we've come back to, we like all the demos we've been working on. I think there's just a lot of like, um, 
self doubt about like making that that change in the moment because you know it's a scary thing to kind of like depart from what you have been doing. But uh, in the end, it came out great, and like people really like that record, and it set them on the path that they're currently on, and it's working for them really well. And I think they're very happy. But you know, there was psychologically speaking, like you're talking about earlier, like there was there's a lot there because like I feel like it's a producer's role <clears throat> in those situations to be kind of the leader, the person to give them reassurance and like to reaffirm that what they're doing is is good. You know, to give them the the self confidence. I think it's really really important. The other band. Kill it with fire. Mm-hmm. Is that is that a is that an ongoing thing or is that just something is it just something that you and Ben and Zach do for just for the hell of it or something or what's uh, what's going on with that? Oh and yeah, how does that factor into your how does that factor into your production schedule for other people? Oh, that's just a thing when we have free time we work on, but uh, we wanted to get some songs out already. Like we were actually really planning on it, but. Um, you know, it just is kind of like a, one of those things where a conflict of interest with asking is really scheduled and stuff like that. So we're just kind of waiting for a while to see. I mean, there's no rush, man. You know, I own a studio. We can record whenever we want. So we're just kind of like every once in a while we'll get together and work on some songs. We have, we have a couple, like five or six demos, I think. They're pretty good. I like them. So that's still going to be an, that is still going to be an ongoing thing. Most likely, yeah. Unless you know, we just never get to it. But I think it will probably happen. Do you see yourself ever doing that thing where you're going to get on the road and play twenty gigs with from first to last, or with Kill It with Fire, or anybody? Do you think, or do you think like, yeah, I think those days are over? Um, I feel decently confident saying that those days are over because I have a six month old baby now, and I'm married, and I really, I don't. I don't really see that working out for me at this point because I like to be home with my family and, you know, be there for them. Without that naive ambition, like, who would really want to do this? And when you really sit there and ask yourself that question, it's like, I think the answer is probably nobody. So um, I think it's kind of an integral part of the process. And, you know, you learn as you go that things are not as you thought that they or as you thought they were. And honestly, I have to admit that even now they are so far away from what people with that mindset think that they are because of the trend of, you know, digital downloading and like how the internet has taken such a huge uh, role in artists lives and fan connectivity and everything. But you're right. I mean, people come in every day and they're like, yeah, man, we just can't, all we want to do is just get on tour so we can live off music. And I'm like, okay, well, (laughs) That's that's a ladder, and that ladder has probably 250 steps on it. So let's let's just start on step one. Let's make some good songs, and we'll just go from there. How many how many Walmart parking lots do you think you've slept in? Me? Oh God, tons, tons, tons and tons. Yeah. I've done I've done the 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 most desperate shit, man. I swear. It's like when we first started, there was there was literally no bounds to it. It was just like. Oh man, we haven't eaten in a whole day. Oh well, there's Panera Bread's dumpster. Let's go get the leftover rolls that they throw away at the end of the night. Like that, that was my reality. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people still don't, still don't understand that. That uh, yeah, it's it's insane. Um, you know, I was going to ask you. My 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 final question was going to be, if you decided to say fuck it and walk away from all this, what would you do? But ultimately, all during this conversation there was never ever ever going to be a plan B but it seems like you're very happy where you are now yeah well it's like I was saying earlier like you know I think the plan B is uh it devalues what you're doing a little bit because there's certain there's certain things in life where it's either you go all the way and you you go with every single part of your being or you don't go at all. And I think um, um, either fortunately or unfortunately, the music business is one of those things. There's just no two ways about it. You're either in and you are in a hundred percent or you are not in at all. And I've always kind of felt like that since day one. And I still feel like that today as a 34 year old father who's married and, you know, lives in a house and records in the studio every day. It it just, that will never change because there are so many people that want this job, like not my particular job necessarily, but just to be able to work in music and make a living off of it. And I feel extraordinarily lucky that I, uh, 
I got to be that person, you know, I feel like I'm probably in like a 0.01% bracket at this point, but, uh, um, it, it's a, it's an all or nothing, uh, industry for sure. So having a plan B, uh, I feel like, you know, that just makes in a way it makes your, your vision weak, weakened slightly. Cause like, I think, you know, in the back of your mind, if you always know, Oh, I can just go do this. And then it automatically takes away, you know, part of the all or nothing I was talking about. And I guess right now as we're talking, it was it's all been worth every every failed relationship, every broken friendship, every every family function you may have missed if you were out on tour or something like that, that sort of thing. I mean you know what I mean? A lot of people don't understand that if you have to you have to do a lot to it to put it all out there to get it. And uh but looking back on it now, are there any do you have any type of really massive regrets you know actually today like right now as i'm sitting here i don't have any anymore there if you had asked me maybe like six seven years ago i'd probably say i had some but i like to look at everything in in my life and i feel like it's good for anyone to do this but i like to look at everything in my life that i've ever done that has resulted in anything other than 100 percent positive as a learning uh experience and So, like, I think back on things where it's like, man, I wish I had done that differently. It's like, well, instead of wishing I had done it differently, I should just take it for what it is and make sure that when it happens again, I do it differently. You know, it's better to just act instead of wish. You know what I mean? Fair enough. I think mainly I would say just try not to sweat the small stuff too much and, uh, you know, just really try to, you know, take some time if you can at least once a day just to sit back and reflect on what it is that you have and what it is that you want and how to get there and to stay motivated and stay positive. And because uh, if there's one thing I could tell myself, like back at the height of from first to last success, I think it would be just like, hey, man, like just slow it down for a second and just like really look around you. Like look at what you've achieved. Look at all that you've built and like be happy about it because I was a victim of enough or it's never good enough. I was always in the mindset that no matter what it was, it was never good enough. You know, like we're on we're on tour with Fall Boy playing sold out arenas across the entire uh, North American region. And I was like, man, this is awesome, but we should be bigger. So we're higher up on the billing. You know what I mean? Like that that shouldn't be on your mind. I don't personally think that should be on your mind. I, it's good to just sit back and just really appreciate what it is in that moment. So otherwise those moments, you know, they're fleeting and all you'll have is a memory of them. And it's, it's better to, for it to be a positive one. Sounds perfect. 